We, of Alcoholics Anonymous, are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. Chapter 5. How It Works Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program, usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. At some of these we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way. But we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Here are the steps we took, which are suggested as a program of recovery. 1. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. 2. Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. 3. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. 8. Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. 9. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10. Continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. I usually ask the guys, what are the first three dimensions? And they kind of look at me like I'm insane, you know, all right? I had to go look it up. To be honest with you, I didn't know what they were. I, I'd heard all kinds of things. The physical dimensions are height, length, and width. Dimensions of time are past, present, and future. The mental dimensions are thought, perception, and feeling. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about physical properties of mass, length, and time. They're physical properties. The fourth dimension by default, when you're talking about physics, is the spiritual dimension. Our goal is to be have a spiritual awakening as what? 
a result, a direct result of the 12 steps so that we can wake up, be conscious when we plug our plug into the power of God and be rocketed into the spiritual dimension, a conscious contact of God as our own concept. And any time I talk about God this weekend, I'm talking about whatever your concept is. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. 5. Admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. 6. We're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. 7. Humbly asked Him to remove our shortcomings. 8 made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. 9. Made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10. Continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Here's another one. I've been sober a long time. My life's manageable now. I can drink now. That's called mental obsession. So if I'm truly, if I truly have no power over mental obsession, I truly have no power over the phenomenon of craving once I put the alcohol in my body, how can I possibly have a manageable life? So you see, basically, step one tells me this. I have no power and I need a new manager. That's basically what it's saying. Okay, page 36. Page 36, two lines from the bottom of the page. Page 36, two lines from the bottom. He had much knowledge about himself as an alcoholic, yet all reasons for not drinking were easily pushed aside in favor of the foolish idea that he could take whiskey if only he mixed it with milk. Page 39. Page 39, paragraph 1, line 5. Page 39, paragraph 1, line 5. But the actual or potential alcoholic, with hardly an exception, will be absolutely unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. So stop and ask yourself, can I stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge? Maybe that's the key. Yeah, that's it. Information, knowledge. I need knowledge. After all, we are in an era of information. That's it. I need info, input, input. Give me more input. Yeah. That, that's the ticket. Yeah, that'll keep me sober. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to find out who's an alcoholic. If you truly believe that you have no power over mental obsession, over the phenomenon of craving, and that your life is unmanageable. Let's turn to page 30.
page 30, paragraph 2. Page 30, paragraph 2. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. You notice that the authors aren't saying that we have to fully concede to our sponsor or the group. You will have an opportunity to examine that in a moment. In addition to that, this is what I would encourage you to do. This is the same thing my sponsor had me do. Go home and sit with me, myself, and my soul and ask myself this question. Am I willing to concede to my inner self that I have no power and that I need a new manager? Basically, if I say, if I say yes, this is what I'm saying. I'm saying, yes, I had an abnormal reaction. Yes, I did experience the phenomenon of craving. No sufficient reason was enough to keep me sober. I lost all control once I started to drink. And I have lost the power to choose whether I will or will not drink. So you see, what's most important is conceding to myself. As long as I'm clinging to the idea that I have some power, some knowledge, some information, some memory that's going to keep me sober, there's no room for step two. Look what it says in step two. Came to believe in what? A power greater than myself. So you see, if I'm still clinging to the idea inside of me, I have some power. There's no room for that, is there? And that has been my experience. That's what happened to me in that 12 years I was bouncing in and out of these rooms. I was never willing to concede to my innermost self that I have no power. I was convinced that I had the answer, that I was smarter than everyone else, that I could still choose to not drink, that self-knowledge was the key. I was convinced of it. My behavior, my experiences illustrates that. If I truly believe that I don't have the power, what am I doing testing it? I'm going to drink no matter what. See, I'm faced with that every single morning that I wake up. Well, I'm going to drink today. Today's the day. I'm going to drink. Why? Because I'm going to drink no matter what. That's why I've learned to resort to the spiritual principles, the spiritual practices like prayer, meditation, evening review, working with others, telling other people what's going on with me. I've got this reputation of being real controversial. Uh, what happened was, uh, I got tired of watching people die in this fellowship. You know, I got tired of people not understanding that you can recover from this illness called alcoholism. And I'll tell you, we've got some drug addicts in here, you can recover from that too. You can just substitute the word with what everything I'm saying this morning because it's applicable. I believe I heard the word of God say, Chris, you have never given the fellowship of AA a try. You've been around it for, for eight years. You've been going to hundreds of meetings. You dated their women. You drank their coffee. You know, you pissed and moaned in their meetings. You know, you, you, you occupied their time. But you, but you really never did do what the book asked you to do. We just read how it works. You never did do that, did you? <laughs> no, I didn't. Found my way back into another AA meeting. I'm going to tell you straight going in the door, it wasn't an AA meeting like any other AA meeting. It was an AA meeting where everybody was carrying big books. Now, you've got to hear what I'm saying. Everybody was carrying big books. From the brand new sobriety to the old coots, they all had a point of reference. And they were on the table and they were ready to use them. And there was no opinion sharing in that meeting. Everybody came out of the book. It wasn't a big book study. It was a, 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 an AA meeting like AA was supposed to be. It was a pep rally where we talked about the power of God. And that's what I needed to hear. Because I was so depressed I just wanted to die. I'm sitting in that meeting detoxing and those people loved me enough to pat me on the head and say, Buddy, you know, this ain't just about coming to meetings. This is about working some steps. And what we want you to do is we want you to recover from this bullshit. And I'm going to start off right now and tell you right now I have a tendency to cuss on occasion. It is disrespectful and I'm trying to get better at it. 
On page 17 in the big book it says that we have a, this common problem and our common problem is one thing that ties us together, right? Now I'm looking around the room and, and it's pretty ludicrous of me to think that every one of us is on the same playing field because we're not. You see, some of us in this room are real alcoholics. There's three, four places in the big book where Bill Wilson talks about the real alcoholic. Folks, he wanted us to make the distinction. By God, if you're a real alcoholic, there are certain things that you must hear in order to survive this disease. If you're not, all the other peripheral stuff in the world might help you stay sober. Everybody in AA is not alcoholic. But let's find out. You see, because if you're the real McCoy, if you're properly diagnosed, there is only one solution for you. It, what did the book say? The book said God could and would if he were sought. Turn to page 20. Moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. Then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have had the habit badly enough to gradually impair himself physically and mentally. It may cause this buckaroo to die a few years before their time. But, here it is. If a sufficient strong e reason comes along, ill health, falling in love, change in environment, a warning from a doctor becomes operative. This man or woman can also stop or moderate, although they may find it difficult and troublesome, may even need medical attention. Hard drinker. Given sufficient reason, it's affecting your health, can you stop? You know what stop means, folks? <laughs> What's the next sentence say? But what about the real alcoholic? See, folks... As long as we've got real alcoholics in this world, as long as we've got real addicts in this world, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing here. I'm going to keep splitting the hairs with this business so that we understand that we can recover from this thing. But as long as there's people out here like the real alcoholic, we're going to keep talking about this because we need to understand it. There is hope. There is absolute hope for us. God, I wish somebody in 1979 had told me that. They said, keep coming back. It works. And I did for eight years and nearly died. Nobody said, it ain't, it ain't about meetings. It's about working the steps so that you can have your spiritual experience. The steps are a path to God, folks. It's not a self-help program. Let's read this paragraph. But what about the real alcoholic? He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker, but at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his consumption once he starts. Follow me? Folks, this is what a real alcoholic is. You, again, you can substitute the word drugs in here. This is what a real drug addict is. It's about control and choice, and that's it. Period. End of statement. It's what the book says on dozens of pages. It's about control and choice. It has got nothing to do with your drama. I don't care how many penitentiaries you've been in. That's not why you're an alcoholic. We could sit here right now and say, all of you be therapists today and I'll be the drunk and you're going to diagnose me with alcoholism. And I'm going to give you a little information and I'm going to say, okay, uh, I'm here to see you. Uh, I've just had uh, my second DWI and my wife and I are fixing to get a divorce. Have I given you enough information to diagnose me with alcoholism? But you see, a lot of us in the fellowship need to know this. A lot of therapists would say, absolutely, he's an alcoholic. But you see, that's not what the book said. What you need to do is start asking me two, two key questions. Exactly what the, what the book asked me. When I'm drinking... Can I guarantee you every time that I can control how much I'm going to drink? Look at your experience, folks. Look at the truth based on your experience. N well, no. <laughs> I can sometimes. <laughs> okay, can you, can you guarantee me you can control it every time? No. Okay, that means you have the phenomenon of craving that the doctor's opinion talks about. Now then, if given sufficient reason, you can quit on your own, you're not one of us. Nowhere in the book does it say you've got to go to prison or have DWIs or get in fights or rob liquor stores or black out or piss your pants or do anything else. No, nowhere in there. But in the first 164 pages, it just talks about control and choice. And if you're one of us, folks, it will never get any better. It's a progressive illness and it will get worse and you will eventually die from it. It's like a death sentence sticking around your neck. Nothing is going to change me around the drinking unless it's by God. Now that's what the book says. This is not Chris Raymer's opinion. This has got nothing to do with therapy. This has got nothing to do with process group. This has got to do with a relationship with God. Period. End of statement. That's what Bill Wilson said. That's what Dr. Bob... That's the combined experience of the first 100. You will have a spiritual experience if you're an alcoholic or an addict, or you will, you will drink again. I feel so much better having said that. I just... <laughs> 
I can't tell you. It just makes me so tingly. Because, folks, that's the truth. They say, Chris, you get so passionate up there. I get passionate because I'm not lying to anybody. Everybody says, oh, Chris, but you're so opinionated about this. You see, there's other ways to get sober. You see, but I disagree. Again, if you're the real alcoholic, the book says that we have to have a spiritual experience. Now, if you just happen to be a moderate drinker or a hard drinker, like the book talks about, then maybe, you, maybe that little warm, bubbly bath with all the candles can help you. <laughs> maybe thinking through the drink can fix you, if you have the power to do that. But you see, the book, I'm saying again, in three places that I can take you to right directly, it says, if you're one of us, the real alcoholic, the man and woman on page 21, you have placed yourself beyond human aid. What's AA? Group of humans, isn't it? What's my therapist? What's my treatment center? What's the church? I'm just saying we're a collection of human beings. You can all help me, but there's not one of you in there. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care how connected you are that can guarantee me a relationship with God. You know, we keep letting everybody off the hook, and we keep wanting to play with these words in the big book. We, we keep wanting to put our own interpretations on what this means. On the very title page, it says, How many thousands of men and women have recovered? It means that they woke up one morning, and the desire to drink had left them. Now, that's recovered. I recovered from alcoholism 11 years ago. <laughs> I mean, let's cut to the chase. We got people sitting around, I hear it in meetings all the time. Well, you didn't get this sick overnight, you're not going to get well overnight. You, you know, how sanctimonious are you? I mean, who's the one killing people with their opinions? Where does it say that in the big book? Bill Wilson had a spiritual experience sitting in Towns Hospital working on his ninth step, folks. He was still detoxing when he had his spiritual experience. Dr. Bob, a little less than two weeks. Alcoholic number three, a little less than a week. Already worked the steps. They're out there working with other alcoholics within the week. And we tell these cats to sit around and take their time. Oh, Mike, you're not ready to work with anybody. God tells you when you're ready, folks. God tells you. I don't give a rat's butt if you're two days sober. It's time to go work with another alcoholic in an attic. Folks, we're losing the battle out there. This is a yes or no question. Did you start on the title page and do everything it asked you to do up to page 164? Did you do all three inventories that the four-step did? Did you go make all your damned amends? And are you actively out there working with other alcoholics? Folks, recovery is guaranteed if you do those things. It's a promise that the book tells you. Have you done the work or not? I mean, let's look at this thing with an open mind, folks. I'm looking around the fellowship and I'm seeing a whole bunch of people out there who've got some time under their belt sober, but they're powder dry, they're miserable. That's not recovered. Problem is, I believe, is that we just don't hold enough people accountable about this thing. You see, if Mary's not happy, we need to stop patting her on the head and saying, keep coming back, it'll work. We need to say, why aren't you working the damn steps that got us to a place where we can be happy, joyous, and free? Why aren't you doing the same thing we did? Back in the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous, recovery rates were through the ceiling. History books are full of it. The archives, uh, it explains to us how our success rate was so good back then and what we were doing to receive that success rate. We weren't spending a whole bunch of valuable time trying to explain to people how they could stop relapsing. Relapsing is not necessary. We've got a whole industry grown up around this relapse thing. Oh, a relapse is just inevitable. No. Once the spiritual experience takes place and God's power kicks in, relapse is not necessary. The desire to drink is removed from you completely. Now that's been my experience and the experience of thousands of other alcoholics and addicts that I've had the privilege to work with. Everybody that does the work and has the spiritual experience gets taken to a different place. And everybody that doesn't, doesn't. And they're the vocal majority in AA today. They're the ones that want to come up and take exception and make a bunch of excuses why this won't work. In the early days of AA, again, if you'll pick up any of the history books and read this stuff, we were having like about a 75% success rate. Now, this is published two places in the big book, back in the, in the, in the forwards and then back in the, back in the appendix, it talks about it. Again, the archives are talking about it. Clarence S. There's books out here on the table that I noticed earlier this morning talking about Clarence Snyder. They had nearly 100% success rate around Cleveland. Dr. Bob around Akron, I'm telling you, damn near 100% success rate with the people coming into the fellowship. You guys don't have to be rocket scientists. Look at your own meetings. Look at your own fellowships and watch the people come in and go back out. Come in and go back out. Come in and go back out. 
Why? Because we were using our meetings as therapy groups. We were using our meeting as process groups. We were not using the meetings as pep rallies to talk about God. One more time, folks. You know, alcoholism and drug addiction is not a behavioral problem. Mary didn't just get set on a potty backwards one time and wake up and say, well, God damn, my parents were assholes. Now I'm an alcoholic. I tell you, if I say one thing from the podium, it's controversial, it's this. And everybody wants to come up and say, yeah, but you understand. You need to see, this had something to do with the rape. This had something to do with the molestation. This had something to do with Vietnam. This had something... I'm saying this. If you will go back to what the book says, given sufficient reason, why don't you deal with those issues and now go? Let me make a, make a kind of a point to you here. Uh, ten years ago, insurance companies used to pay for treatment like slot machine. Within the last ten years, treatment via insurance companies has dropped by about 73%. Why? We, got, we, got, we, need, we have less people that need it, or what? <laughs> no. Thank you, Mr. Crack Cocaine. We have twice as many people now that need it. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Well, we got a nightmare out there. But why won't, why won't the insurance companies pay for it so, so readily? Because we've got a whole bunch of people uh, coming to treatment, dealing with issues, walking back out of treatment, never picking up the big book, never going to 12-step meetings, never doing any 12-step work, never doing what we asked them to do, and, and, and they're not staying sober. And insurance companies, after years of abuse, finally said, we're not paying for that shit anymore. Why should we pay for Mike to come to treatments 15 times? Why? No, but we've got to get straight with this. Why should we? We shouldn't. Because the solution is not if he's a real alcoholic and addict about his issues. You know, people out there in the world, they think we're partying down. We're just, you just need to learn to quit partying so much. Folks, this, this is long beyond partying. That, that, that lady walking into that crack house that she was raped at two nights before is not going back to get some more party. Do y'all understand that? She's trying to get to a place with that crack cocaine so she can be okay inside. We've got to get straight with this business. The book says, I drink and drug for the effect produced by the drug. So, I'm standing up here, I'm spiritually bankrupt, I'm dying inside, and so what I want to do is get okay inside, right? <laughs> so now I've got about 15,000 people trying to help me, trying to treat everything outside. And I need to say this now, before I don't get it in later, a lot of this still goes on in my AA meetings today. It's called junior therapy sessions. Well, I just haven't been able to find a babysitter that's good, you know, that, 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 that. And so we're going to spend the entire hour talking about babysitters. Hi, come on, right now. Everybody's done it. Everybody's setting meetings and just like that. Well, I'm going through a divorce, and I need to talk about my divorce. Well, okay. How, how nice for you. But I'm saying, what does the book ask us to do? The book asks us to talk about the hope and the power of God. But what are we doing? In there pissing and moaning about the traffic. And they're talking about the probation officer. And they're talking about antidepressants. And they're talking about the relationships. And they're talking about the kids. And they're talking about everything under the sun except what we're supposed to talk about, which is the power of God. We all got stuff we need to talk about. That's why God gives us therapists. Go find one. But in my meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous and NA, in my meetings, we need to be talking about the power of God. We need to be talking about how can you have a spiritual experience. And if you want to talk about anything else besides that in my AA meeting, you're in the wrong place. We let it go every day. I hear it until I just want to puke. Well, she, she's just so upset. She just needs a place to share. Well, <laughs> go, so go to Denny's. I've said it a thousand times. We all do this, and we all applaud, and we all say, Chris, you're right, and then we'll go to a meeting tomorrow night, and there'll be some little lady there or some little guy there, and he'll be wanting to talk about his probation officer, and everybody will just cross their head and just kind of go off to sleep. <laughs> and we'll just let them do it. You know what the proper response is there? He says, Bubba, Bubba, excuse me just a minute. We're not going to talk about that right now. You need to help find a sponsor. We can talk about that. <laughs> but right now, we're going to talk about the power of God. We're going to talk about how to have a spiritual experience so that you'll have the power to deal with all of that. Do any of you think that we're going to be able to arrange your life so it will be so perfect that you won't have to drink? You know, your life, whether you've got money or don't have money or you're in the relationship or out of the relationship, it's got nothing to do with whether or not you're going to be drinking or not. See? But we spend a lot of time trying to get you guys to organize your life so that you don't have to drink. Follow me? I, I just go ahead and do it. What the hell? I mean, they talk about it in treatment all the time in therapists. They talk about this triggers list. You know what I mean? Well, we got to get down straight with this business. What is this? 
You're going to make me a list of things that you think are causing you to drink, and we're going to get rid of all of that, and you're still going to be drinking, so why mess with it? we got too many people sharing opinions with us in meetings. We have the solution right here. We have people in meetings, as long as we're on that topic, telling people to just don't drink. But you see, where in the big book does it say that? Turn to page 24. There's a paragraph in italicies. Bill Wilson, uh, this is probably the most controversial paragraphs in the big book. And it's absolutely heresy to read it in AA meetings, so be sure you don't do it, because you'll, you'll piss somebody off, and we don't want to do that, for Christ's sake. <sighs> I'm more concerned with you and your sensitive little feelings than I am with whether or not you find the power of God. So let's get straight here. The fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We are unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory and suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. Just, did you hear what I just said? We are without defense against the first drink. And that's why Bill Wilson understands that the, the, the absolute necessity to have this spiritual experience because, because you may be able to keep yourself sober today. That's why we teach you the stuff in treatment, some of the stuff, the triggers list, the, the, the preventive things that we ask you guys to do. If going back and hanging out in that old bar was a, if you drank at, if staying out of that bar would help you stay sober until you get your feet on the ground, then that's why we do that. Do you understand? But see, the message has been so watered down, we've got so many people believing that what we're trying to explain to you is that that's going to keep you sober. That if I just stay out... Uh, how many of you guys have ever taken a geographical cure? Yeah. You know, I can't tell you how disheartened I was when I found out there was alcohol in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> but I went there with a, with a clear understanding that I was going to get sober over there. The problem is I took this spiritual malady with me, right? This internal condition. Unbelievable. We're going to be unable to remember the horror stories that happened to us even a week or a month ago. Isn't that what the book just said? So let me ask you a question, just for grins. Why do we spend so much time in our meetings telling war stories? But if I haven't had a spiritual experience, and the internal condition reaches such a point that I get caught in what the book calls a mental blank spot, I won't remember Ray's sad story, and I won't remember Jim's, and I promise you I won't remember yours. I'm not even going to remember mine. I'm just going to pick up a drink and go use. You cannot scare an alcoholic into sobriety. That's absolutely right. But we, we continue to do it in meetings till I want to puke. Why are, why are all the people coming to us in a treatment facility situation? Not Again, I'm not knocking treatment. A bunch of people in here got sober in treatment. But I'm telling you, what's going to keep them sober is not the treatment. When they go to that noon meeting, that brown baggers meeting across town, and they're sitting down there eating a ham sandwich, and they're in that room full of people and listen to people talk about how their lives have been changed because of the power of God, they're going to walk out of that room absolutely convicted that what they're doing is right. And as they go work with other alcoholics, they're going to know that they're on the right path because they're outside themselves. And they're, you'll follow what I'm saying? But if they happen to be unlucky enough to end up in a pissing and moaning contest in one of these meetings where everybody wants to sit around and commiserate about their problems, they may get up and go drink. What did the book say on the same page? Our common problem is but one element of the powerful cement that binds us. But that in itself could not hold us together. It's our common solution that holds us together. If you're walking back into a meeting and sharing anything but positive, powerful stuff, you are wrong. You're wrong. And the arrogance of you to think you can do it. Why did we have 75, 100% getting sober back then? Because they didn't do that shit. AA was not a therapy group. AA was a pep rally. Well, it's the truth. AA was a pep rally. We know what the problem is, folks. Does anybody have the solution? Then that then arrogance of me to walk into a meeting and think that I can bore you with some trivial, stupid inconvenience that I'm going through today. Everybody wants to let them off the hook. Well, they've got to have a place to share. I'm going to say it again. Come see me after the meeting. Come see me before the meeting. Let's go find a therapist. Let's go find a professional. Let's go talk to a lawyer about that divorce. I've got one responsibility. To help you get on the spiritual path so that you can find the relationship with God that you've always wanted. To wake up in the morning. To sit down in this garden this morning and cry crocodile tears because it's just so cool out there. You know, it's just gorgeous to watch men and women that I watched come in and absolutely burnt toast and to watch them out there kicking butt and taking names today. Did I do that? Shit, no, God did that. The credit goes to God. 
when we get back on square one, when we start talking about this stuff in our meetings again, we'll have success rate just like we did back in the olden days. We'll have people getting sober and staying sober. Relapse prevention. It's an oxymoron. You can't keep yourself sober. You can keep yourself sober today, maybe, and maybe tomorrow, but there will come a time, I'm just going to have one glass of champagne. Where does the crazy thinking come from? It comes from the disease of alcoholism, folks. And that crazy thinking will continue to come back until you recover. And once you recover, the book says sanity returns and then you can come and go as you please. The book says, says self-knowledge avails us nothing. If self-knowledge availed us much of anything around drinking and drugging, folks, why do we have so many licensed chemical dependency counselors coming through treatment at our facility? Why do we have so many doctors and lawyers and psychiatrists coming through treatment. Because self-knowledge can't fix what's wrong with you. God can. ABCs. God could and would if He were sought. And that's the bottom line. I'm going to back out of this real quick. <clears throat> Try to mend some feelings because I know I've stepped on some of you. I want to go on record now I am not knocking therapy. Therapy is wonderful. I'm not knocking treatment. If you're relapsing and you have any chance to go to treatment, it's a wonderful experience, please do. But if you think for a second that that therapist will get you sober, if you think for a second that treatment center will get you sober and keep you sober, you are mistaken. I will never back off that. It's what the book says. God keeps me sober. God keeps me sober. And my only job today is to stay connected to God. So what do I do? I work the steps with a sponsor who's had a spiritual experience as a result of the steps. I continue to have daily meditation and prayer like we were talking about this morning. And most, most absolutely on top of everything, I place myself so that I can be of service to you. I am at your beck and call 24 hours a day if you want to talk about the power of God. Everything I have today, including my life, comes from the power of God. The only thing God asked me to do is give back a little bit. The book says a price has to be paid. The problem with so many of us in AA today is that we're not willing to pay the price. We think because we went to treatment and spent a bunch of money that we paid the price. We did not. The people that are paying the price are the people down at the halfway house holding those people's hands, walking them through the steps. The people that are paying the price are back at the detox center helping those nurses volunteer, helping those people carrying the message of hope back into those facilities. The people that are paying the price are sitting on the front row in our AA meetings waiting for the newcomer to come in the door to reach out and hold them. The book says we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and addicts who still suffer. We tried to carry this message. Doesn't mean we sat on the front porch and, and thought about our own little shit. Listen, folks, I know I got some problems, and you got problems, and you need some time to talk about that. But in an AA meeting, you need to have your little eyeball peeled for the newcomer coming in the door. Is the guy getting the kind of sponsorship that he's supposed to have? You see? Bill Wilson wrote it in the archives, folks, and, and it's there in... Um, uh, AA Comes of Age, it was out of old grapevine letters, written back in 1958, and, I, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big history of AA, and I'm loving this stuff. But Bill Wilson's saying is this, and I'm going to close with this. He says, Alcoholics Anonymous is not going to be, this is a paraphrase, I don't have it in front of me, I looked for it, couldn't find it. He says, Alcoholics Anonymous is not going to be destroyed from the outside. The world loves us, you know, we're off the street, you know, we, we ain't messing with their daughters no more. They love us being here, you know. He says, AA is not going to be destroyed from the outside, it's going to be destroyed from the inside. And just like individual people like Mary and Mike and James, just like we have to take our own inventory and do our own work in the 12 steps, AA must do the same thing too. And when James finds a flaw in his character, he takes it to God and tries to change. And AA better change. We better stop sitting on our ass doing it the way we're doing it now because it ain't working. If our success rates are so low, could it possibly be, and this is what Bill Wilson's asking us to look at, even back as far as 1958, could it possibly be that the people today are not getting the kind of sponsorship that we got back when we got sober? I travel around a lot, folks, and I get to see it. Are we doing what we're supposed to do in our meetings? Are we carrying that message of hope? Are our meetings pep rallies? Or have they denigrated into a therapy group where we try to process your feelings? 
You want to feel better? Let me just put it. You want to feel better? You go to the next AA meeting that you're at, and you find the most busted up buckaroo in there. And you go up to him, and you get him a cup of coffee, and you sit down with him in the book, you sponsor him, and you start him on the spiritual journey, and you watch the light come on in his eyes when he finally realizes that he has some hope, that he don't ever have to get up and drink again, that he don't ever have to go back into that crack house. He don't ever, ever have to do the things that he's been doing just to get through the day. And you sit down with a minute, get out of yourself, spend a few moments with this cat, and watch the miracle take place. I owe those people in North Texas that finally got me and got me the book, I owe them my life. Somebody said the other day, I said it a thought, Chris, you, you're too busy. You need to slow down. You need to quit speaking so much. You, you mind your own damn business. I'll take care of my, my social schedule. When, he says, when is your debt to AA going to be paid off? My mom asked me that question one time. I said, what do you mean from a man that could not not drink? And I had a spiritual experience. Nothing's fancy, nothing great. Just a garden variety, by God, you better believe, life-changing experience as a result of somebody caring enough to give me the message of hope. Not to pat me on the head and just let me sit in the meetings, but to give me the message of hope. I owe them my life. And I'll pay that debt until I die. Gladly. Everybody that comes to that facility, we monitor after they leave. You know who stands over? The people that are sponsoring people, right? We guys have been out of treatment two months sponsoring people. Old timers giving them a hard time. You ain't been sober long enough. Show me in the book where it says that. At least they're off there dead ass trying to excite something about the fellowship. This ain't about ego. This is about God. This is about power. If this tide of alcoholism and drug addiction is going to be changed, it will be changed by the power of God. It will be changed by the power of one alcoholic sharing with a new alcoholic. One drug addict, one crack addict sharing with a new crack addict. Y'all follow me? Until you've walked into a room and sat down and watched somebody that you've had something to do with carrying the message of hope to them and you see how this chain you, you ain't lived. You don't know what high is until you see that what the power of God can do. You watch people come through this shit that, would, that kept them in psychiatric units for years all of a sudden to come clear on the other side and be a powerful unit in this fellowship. Out there making plenty of money in great relationships. How did that all happen? It happened because they got out of themselves for a minute and helped somebody else. Selfishness and self-centeredness is the root of my problems. We've talked about our own shit long enough, folks. It's time to go help somebody else. God's in the pots and the pans. That's what my sponsor taught me. God's in the trenches. He's not up on some spiritual mountaintop. He's in the trenches, cleaning up puke, taking people to meetings, sitting down when you're so damn tired you can't stand it, to sit down and say, okay, start on the title page and doing what you're supposed to do, which is called carry the message of hope. My name's Chris Framer, and I'm an alcoholic and a dope fiend. Amen. There's a bunch of you in this room who I'm going to scald tonight. And some of the things I'm going to say you are not going to agree with. Some of you guys are going to love what i got to say because I'm going to validate what you've been thinking and saying for years. And some of you, you, you love me right up until the point I say something you don't agree with, and then, I, and then I'm a little opinionated when I'm son of a bitch, you see. And that's how... <laughs> If I say something that makes you uncomfortable, maybe, maybe you need to be uncomfortable. You don't have to agree with everything I say, but everything I'm going to say is going to come out of this big book. See, I'm, I'm one of these cats out there on the circuit that believes that we're killing a lot of people in AA. My first venue into this fellowship was about 1981, and uh, I didn't get sober for about seven years, folks, in and out of these, these rooms. The reason I couldn't get sober, everybody wants to let, let everybody else off the hook. Well, you just weren't ready. The truth of the matter is, folks, I would be in meetings and never hear about God in the steps. Okay? I spent years sitting in AA listening to you share your damned opinions endlessly. So try to come at this with an open mind. I'm just trying to make some very valid points that I think us as a fellowship needs to hear. Because I've got to tell you something, folks. As a fellowship, we're doing a poor job carrying this message. we got one primary purpose, folks. Each group has but one primary purpose is to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. The message is in the big book. The message is the 12 steps. The message is God in the steps. The message is not your effing issue. Big on page 155 in the big book, it said he had a desperate desire. He's talking about Dr. Bob here. He said he had a desperate desire to stop but saw no way out. For he had earnestly tried many avenues of escape. Painfully aware of being somehow abnormal, the band did not fully realize what it meant to be alcoholic. 
With me? Did you get that? We're talking about Dr. Bob, one of the co-founders of the, of the fellowship. He couldn't get sober, folks, because he, had, he didn't really understand what it was to be an alcoholic. And that's what I'm going to talk about first going into this deal, because a lot of you cats sitting in this room, you may, be a, you may have some dry time under your belt, but bottom line is, one of the reasons that you chafe because we get rigid with the big book is that, is that you're not doing the steps. And you're not doing the steps because you don't think you need to. Because you really don't understand what, it's, what it is to be an alcoholic. You know, I mean, there's a belief out there in AA land that, that alcoholism, and I'm going to go ahead and include drug addiction in this, alcoholism and drug addiction is some kind of behavioral problem. That there's something out there causing us to drink. And, and guys, I'm going to tell you something. If that's the case, you're not one of us. Go away. <laughs> no, it's the truth. If, if, if your wife is the cause of your drinking, go get another one. <laughs> But, but, but quit pissing and moaning about your wife because it ain't got nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. And this is what the book says. You either need to be here or you don't need to be here. Now, we've got to get down with this, guys, because I'm going to tell you something. One of the reasons the fellowship is going through so much trouble right now is that we've got a lot of people that don't think they really need to be here sharing with us in meetings. And the stuff that they're sharing is shit. <laughs> I know, I'm off to a great start, aren't I? Okay. <laughs> I'm page... 34. Middle paragraph, it says, For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. We're assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. Here's the sentence. Whether such a person can quit on a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose whether he's going to drink or not. Did y'all get it? It's, the way it's written, it's difficult to understand. But if, if you can quit on a non-spiritual basis, if you can quit given sufficient reason, you're not one of us. That's why the book continues to say, if you want to go try some controlled drinking, go try it. The physical allergy and the mental obsession and the spiritual malady. This is what alcoholism is, folks. It's time some of you got down to brass tacks. Some of you slippers in here. Some of you chronic relapsers. That's me. It took me eight years to get this deal. I'm just like you. Some of you need to think about this. You need to stop being sold a bill of goods. I'm going to say this again. Alcoholism and drug addiction is not a behavioral problem. It's a disease. You either got it or you don't got it. Period. The book says on page 24 that an alcoholic has lost the ability to choose whether he's going to do this or not. Folks, if you still have the power to choose you're going to, when you're going to drink, when you're not going to drink, if you, if, you, if you not having any alcohol in your body, you can get up in the morning and every morning guarantee me that you're going to make the right choice, you're not one of us. You're not. In a birthday meeting two weeks ago, listen to some son of a bitch stand up behind the podium in a room just like this, packed with people. Get up and says, I've been sober for 10 years. I got up this morning and chose not to drink. I wonder how many people he killed with that information. <laughs> if you can choose not to drink, you're not one of us. We've got to get straight here, folks. The book is crystal clear about this. Choice. On page 26 and 27. The story is about an American businessman. We're talking about Roland Hazard in here. He'd gone to Carl Jung at the, at the, in the early 30s uh, to try to get well. As the story goes, this cat, he had a lot of money, and he went to, uh, uh, to Europe and spent a year in psychoanalysis. And after a year working on his issues, he came back to the States with the absolute conviction that he would never drink again. What happened was the historians tell us that within a couple of weeks, he was loaded on his butt. And he goes back, he calls Young and says, what's up with this business, buddy? He says, we just spent a year and a lot of money trying to get fixed here, just like a lot of y'all do when you leave treatment and fall on your butts. And you come back and say, what's up? Huh, I thought you fixed me. <laughs> yeah, and here's what it says. He says he begged the, do the, the doctor to tell the whole truth, and he got it. In the doctor's judgment, he was utterly hopeless. He could never regain his position in society and would have to be place himself beyond, under lock and key if he was expected to live long. This was the great physician's opinion. But this man still lives and is a free man. He does not need a bodyguard, nor is he confined. He can go anywhere on earth, doesn't have to worry about his stupid triggers. He's a free man so far as we can tell. You with us? Provided he remains willing to maintain a certain simple attitude. The doctor had told this cat, you had the mind of a chronic alcoholic. I've never seen one single case recover where this state of mind existed to the extent that it does in you. Our friend heard the gates of hell close around him with a clang. He asked the doctor if there weren't any exceptions. The doctor said, yeah, there is. Exceptions to your cases have been occurring since early times. Here and there, once in a while, alcoholics have had what we call vital spiritual experiences. To me, these occurrences are a phenomena. They appear to be in the nature of huge, huge emotional displacements and rearrangements. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes which were once the guiding force completely set aside with a new conception 
of these motives begin to dominate. In fact, I've been trying to get that to take place in you. We've seen it happen with others. We were hoping it would happen with you. Now, come on, guys. I've got hundreds of, of places in the book where Bill Wilson talks about a spiritual experience. He talks about a vital spiritual experience. Here's what happened. When Carl Jung gave the message to Roland, he didn't say that he needed to go home and divorce his wife and change some things and, and uh, get his Gorski relapse prevention triggers and list out and do all the cool... He didn't, he didn't do any of that, did he? He got down to brass tacks and said, Buddy, the only thing that's going to save your skinny little butt is a relationship with God. Not, not, not belief in God. Not knowledge of God. A relationship with God. And that's why so many of you can't stay sober. I mean stay sober for good. Not one stupid day at a time. I mean stay sober. Why can't you stay sober? Because you won't get this relationship with God. God, it's amazing how concerned we are with the newcomer. We're so concerned with hurting their feelings and running them out of here with this God talk that we won't talk about it at all. Shame on us. That's what we're going to talk about right now. Carl Young talked to Roland Hazard about this business. Roland comes back to the United States. He gets involved with the Oxford movement. Y'all know the story. And he carries this message to Ebby. Ebby gets involved in the Oxford movement. And Ebby starts to do this step. Now, we had the rudimentary 12 steps in the Oxford movement. And Ebby begins to do this work. And he has a spiritual experience. Six months sober, guys, as the book says, he goes and calls on... He goes and calls on our co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson. And he tells Bill Wilson... Simple but not easy, a price had to be paid. It meant destruction of self-centeredness. I must turn in all things to the Father of Light which presides over us all. This was a revolutionary and drastic proposal. For, for, but the moment I fully accepted them, the effect was electric. There was a sense of victory, followed as such by, by such peace and serenity as I had never known. Boy, now how cool is that? How would you like to go out with one of these street guys right now that still stinks of the goddamn pipe out there drinking, doing things we don't want to talk about and tell him that he'd wake up in the morning with a piece of sense and a sense of peace and serenity? The best we can muster up is that you can stay sober one day at a time and throw some chicken shit one-liners at him. <laughs> Ebby talks to him and just tells him point blank, if you want to continue to do this deal, you're going to have to grow spiritually. You're going to have to continue to do this deal with God. You're going to have a spiritual experience coming into the door and then you're going to grow spiritually by working with others. That's the primary purpose that we talk about. By working with others, that spiritual experience is going to grow and manifest itself and change. Bill Wilson comes right back around and talks to Dr. Bob. What did he tell Dr. Bob? 90 meetings in 90 days. <laughs> so how many of you guys ever drank, went to 90 meetings in 90 days and drank? <laughs> Let me get to the chase here. About 1939, 1940, when we got the book was published, the big book was published in 1940, uh, 1939, we had success rates around the country that were through the ceiling, folks. Literally. In Akron, Ohio, Cleveland area, right around there, we had nearly 100% success rate. Cats coming into the fellowship getting sober. Worst case scenario, we had about 70% getting sober. Dig? That's pretty good stuff. Right now in the United States, the success rate is still about 8%. 8% of the cats coming through the door stay for any period of time. That's absolutely tragic. Now why? What happened? Watered down AA. Watered down Cocaine Anonymous. Watered down meetings. Watered down message. Watered down everything, folks. Because we've gotten so concerned with hurting somebody's sensitive little feeling. You see, folks, here's the bottom line. What, what, is, what, is, the, what is the ultimate thing that happens in a spiritual experience that concerns alcoholics of our nature? The obsession to use is, re is removed. That means that you wake up in the morning and you don't want to smoke crack cocaine. You wake up in the morning and you don't want to eat pills or you don't want to drink alcohol. Now that's a pretty cool deal. Now if I can guarantee that for you and all you're going to have to do is use a little humility and find God, ask for God's help. If getting humble and for God is too much of a swallow for you, then I suggest you go drink some more alcohol and see then if you can get to the point where you're willing to do what you need to do. We just read it when we read How It Works. Are you willing to do whatever's necessary to get sober? Well, yeah, unless I have to say the G word. <laughs> when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1980, what did I want to talk about? Relationships. How about money? How about feelings? Come on, guys, we could go on and on. We could go here all night. How about the rape? How about the molestation? How about the adoption? Huh? How about the babysitter? Huh? How about the traffic? I hear it all, every time I come to a meeting in Houston, Texas. Somebody's up there pissing and moaning about the traffic. Why are we wasting somebody's time talking about that shit? Where's, where's the chairperson when some of that crap stops? Where, where's the person that's got some balls that can stand up and say, Hey, buddy, <laughs> shut up! 
Jesus. We're not here to talk about that. Where's our primary purpose? Where's our primary purpose? Our primary purpose is to talk about God in the steps, not the goddamn traffic. Unbelievable. What are we doing? This is exactly what we're trying to talk about. How many of you guys in here, play with me real quick, how many of you guys in here drank when you had a great relationship? Good, sound, solid relationship. How many of you drank when you had a shitty relationship? How many when you had lots of money? Crap for money. $300,000 home, beautiful home. But this is the shit that you want to talk about. You come into treatment, that's all you want to talk about. And you know, if you get in the wrong treatment center, that's all they'll let you talk about. With the belief that you get it all talked out and get it all out open, that you can stay sober. And we're walking into meetings, and all we're talking about up there... Now, I'm up in North Texas, folks, and there's about 40 treatment centers within a very small, dense area. We're cranking in the Denton area, we're cranking about a thousand recovering alcoholics a week into our system. And they're all coming in with all kinds of good shit that they heard in treatment. And they're bringing their Gorski relapse prevention triggers list. And they're, bringing, and they're bringing their process talk. And they're bringing all the cool stuff they learned in treatment. And they're bringing it into our AA meetings. Now here's what AA did. Here's what AA did. AA buckled. AA buckled under the weight. And we backed away from the book and the solution that we had had for years. And we said, whatever works for you is fine with me. After all, these are just suggestions. And the meetings went down the toilet. And the success rates went to shit. On page 44 or 45 it says, Like a power, that's my dilemma. I mean, I've heard people time after time, Chris, you talk too much about God. You're scaring the newcomers off. What, what is this? There's, there's only one message that we have to carry. You must have a spiritual experience. Otherwise, the insanity of the first drink will stay with you and you will die. We are not here as a social group. Go to Herman's Sons if you want to just socialize. Don't come into my meetings if that's the only reason you're here. There's a difference between a real alcoholic and a hard drinker. If you're a hard drinker, let me tell you this, guys. You're talking about something that you know nothing about. I'm trying to talk about two things right now tonight that are the most difficult things to convey to anybody. What an alcoholic is, if you're not an alcoholic and you don't understand the obsession to use, you're sitting in here believing, truly deep down inside, that Chris Raymer continues to drink because he's weak. The other thing that's so difficult to understand is a spiritual experience. A bunch of you cats in this room have had the spiritual experience. The obsession to use has been removed from you. You are not staying sober one stupid day at a time. You have recovered from alcoholism and drug addiction. Isn't that right? And I don't have to say nothing. All I have to do, all I have to do is look at you and go, huh, huh? And you go, huh, huh, yeah, yeah. We don't even have to talk. We know exactly what we're talking. Isn't that right? We know exactly what we're talking about. How many of you have gone into meetings and listened to somebody say, take your time to work the steps? We're killing them all over the world with that shit. No, wait a minute. The book just said that a spiritual experience is necessary for me to change my life. Have a huge emotional display, a huge shift of attitude so that I can have a decent relationship with a woman, so that I can get a credit card and make some money, so that my creative juices will start flowing again, so that I can get happy, joyous, and free. And that's going to happen as a result of doing the work which is going to put me in touch with God. It's a guaranteed spiritual experience if you finish the fucking 12 steps. But we don't have time to talk about that. Y'all with me? And we got some schmuck standing over here on the side because he, because he was able to wait three years to work the steps. He assumes that you're going to be able to wait three years to work the steps. But if you're a real alcoholic, guess what? You're going to die. How's that? You know, you don't, you don't have 30 days to get on solid ground. We need to get you to God and we need to get you to God quick. This is the most powerful path on earth. It's called the spiritual path. And how dare us, how dare us as a fellowship water this message down. Take your time to, take your time to sit on this. I'm telling you. We got... And we just look the other way as a fellowship. We look the other way as a fellowship. Says, well, it's an easy does it program. You can do it any way you want to. Since when is it your God-given right to kill the person sitting next to you? When we go into meetings nine times out of ten, what are we hearing? Opinion. Opinion. Somebody said it. This book is not based on opinion. This book is based on the deaths of millions of alcoholics. You guys continue to come to these meetings and walk on eggshells like every day is going to be a day you're going to go use. That's not recovery. That's hell on earth. <laughs> Isn't it right? And we come into the meetings, the newcomer, and he assumes that everybody is free. And that's so far from the truth. Because a lot of people in our meetings have never worked the steps. They have never done the work. They've talked a lot of talk, but they've never done the work. They're talking about something they don't know anything about. All the archival stuff that I can read out there, and I'm a big reader, all the archival stuff will point the clear picture 
that the cats over in the Cleveland, Akron area were getting sober and the people in New York weren't. Success rates were about three to one in comparison. They had hundreds of members in the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous getting sober and staying sober around Cleveland because Clarence Snyder and Dr. Bob was grabbing these guys. You want to get God? Well, I don't know. Next, do you want to get God? They didn't fuck you. you know, they said, we're going to go with you. Do you want to get God? Do you want to get God? And that's the way they were doing it. Over in New York, we were trying to analyze. That's where one day at a time came from, New York. And none of the cats were getting sober over there because it was placed to them as an option. Well, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And they weren't getting sober. They weren't getting the deal. And so we went back to the basics of the program, what was working then. Big? Oh, I hope you're getting it. Did you start on the title page of the big book where it says that we can recover from alcoholism? Not always be recovering. That we can recover from alcoholism? Did you start on the title page and do everything it asks you to do in the first hundred pages? And ultimately, right now, point blank question, are you out there on a daily basis working with other alcoholics and addicts? Are you sponsoring men and women in the fellowship? And do you have a sponsor? Well, I'm, I've heard it a thousand times. I'm, I'm working my program to the best of my ability. <laughs> No, you're not. The only thing anybody in this room ever did to the very best of their ability is get loaded. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? I, I, have, wa I, have, walked, I have walked to the store in a blizzard. I, wouldn't have, I couldn't get antifreeze in my truck, mind you, but I walked with a broken block on the truck. I walked to the store in a blizzard to get, again, a six-pack of beer. Huh? To the best of my ability? Come on, give me a break. What are you doing to the best of your ability in this program? Are you truly trying to do the, 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 the steps that are outlined in the book? And if you are, guys, you're going to have the guaranteed spiritual experience. I promise you. If you don't know how to do this, you saddle up next to somebody in this group. I can see hundreds of you right now that I've done the work with personally that I know you know how to do this work. You find somebody that's had this experience and you say, you show me how to have a spiritual experience. Not you show me how to stay sober. You show me how to, I can change my life. It's the tip of the iceberg, folks. Staying sober one day at a time, staying sober the rest of your life is the tip of the iceberg. You need the power. You need the power to go out there and kick butt and take names. That's, everybody wants to come up afterwards. Here. Oh, Chris, what do you think this shit? You think AA ought to be a pep rally? It ought to be a pep rally. Because we got too many people in here thinking it ought to be a therapy session. There's therapy is therapy. Legal, legal advice is legal advice over here. The doctor's stuff is over here. Y'all all understand that? There's a place for all of that. AA should be a pep rally. It shouldn't be a place where we're coming in, sharing the miracle. How many of you in this room right now experienced a blessing today that you know exactly where it came from, God? How many of you explain? How dare you not go into a meeting tonight or tomorrow or next week whenever you go back to your AA meeting and share that for the newcomer who is hopeless, who is spiritless, who doesn't believe any of this will work. You come up and you start sharing some good shit. Stop sharing your... Stop going up there trying to share your chicken shit war stories with these cats. No place in the book does it say if you want to get a drunk sober, share your stupid war story. If they're in the room, the 12-step call has already been made. Y'all understand that? We do war stories to get them to come to the room to begin with, to get them comfortable, to get them to identify. Once they're here, it's time for the good shit. It's time for the good stuff. Pour it on and pour it on thick. Talk about the, the obsession being lifted. Talk about the cool relationships. Talk about that picture you're painting. Talk about the music you're writing. Talk about the cool shit. The book says... We are here to bear witness. They may turn and run the other way. I don't know if they're going to get sober. Listen, that's not my job. My job is that I don't germinate the seed. I don't cause the rain. I don't, I don't have the outcome of it's going to grow or not. My job is to plow the damn field. You guys, we got a room full of people who know how to plow. Nobody knows another alcoholic like another alcoholic. You have been spared a terrible death and you know how to get to the other side. All we're asking you to do is plow. You come on to me and there's this, this smarmy, I can't help anybody. I, I can't even help myself. Oh, I just, uh, I just want to... God didn't say help yourself. AA is not a self-help program. Get your book. Sit down with this woman. Sit down with this man. Whoever's having trouble tonight, whoever looks like they're, they just, they're not having a... Sit down and help them a little bit. That's how this thing works.
Deutsch. Normalmente produzco solo videos en inglés y español. Normally I produce only videos in English and Spanish. Normalerweise produziere ich nur videos in English and Spanish. Pero hoy voy a hacer otra excepción y traducirlo también en alemán. But today I make another exception and translate it into German too. Aber heute werde ich nochmal eine Ausnahme machen und es auch in Deutsch übersetzen. Ya algunas semanas tengo escrito en mi lista de tareas por hacer de traducir el video hashtag BTC4. Now already some weeks ago I have written on my to-do list to translate the video BTC4, hashtag BTC4. Schon seit ein paar Wochen habe ich äh, auf meiner To-Do-Liste geschrieben, ähm, den Video BTC4 in Deutsch zu übersetzen. Estoy segura que esta idea puede ayudar a mucha gente económicamente. I'm sure that this can help many people economically. Ich bin sicher, dass diese Idee vielen Leuten äh, finanziell helfen kann. Y da motivación para aprender Bitcoin. And give motivation to learn about Bitcoin. Und motivation geben, um über Bitcoin zu lernen. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy bajo, económico. At the moment the price of Bitcoin is very low, economic. Im Moment ist der Preis von Bitcoin sehr tief. Sería el momento ideal para invertir. Hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Would be the ideal moment to invest. Today is April 15th, 2015. Es wäre der ideale Moment zu investieren. Heute ist der 15. April 2015. El 27 de marzo 2015 he publicado en mi canal de YouTube Vanos Enigma el primer video sobre hashtag BTC4 explicando cómo me vino esta idea. On March 27th of 2015, um, I published my for the first video about hashtag BTC4 in my channel YouTube Vanos Enigma, explaining how I got the idea. Am 27. März 2015 habe ich in meinem YouTube-Channel Vanos Enigma den ersten, den ersten Video über Hashtag BTC4 veröffentlicht und äh, erzählt, erklärt, wie ich diese Idee bekommen habe. La idea consiste principalmente en lo siguiente. The idea mainly consists in the following. Die idea besteht hauptsächlich en folgenden, folgendem. Imprimir en direcciones de Bitcoin en papel. Diez o mínimo diez o mejor cien. To print Bitcoin directions in paper, at least 10 or better 100. 
Bitcoin-Adressen in Papier ausdrucken, ähm, wie die man sehen, oder besser gleich 100, y luego poner en cada dirección de Bitcoin una pequeña cantidad de Bitcoin. And then put in every Bitcoin direction a little amount of Bitcoin. Und dann in jede Bitcoin Adresse eine kleine Summe von Bitcoin transferieren. Y la próxima vez, cuando otra vez ves una persona por la calle pidiendo dinero. And the next time you see again a person begging for money on the street. Und das nächste Mal, wenn du wieder eine Person auf der Straße betteln siehst. Y para tus amigos y amigas, and for your friends, of course, und für deine Freunde natürlich, o tal vez eh, de propina en un restaurante, or maybe a tip in a restaurant, oder trinkgeld im restaurant, bueno, a la hora de imprimir también, Copiar y guardar las llaves privadas de Bitcoin, de direcciones de Bitcoin. Or when you print the Bitcoin addresses, um, copy and save the private keys of the Bitcoin addresses, of course. Wenn man die Bitcoin Adressen druckt, auch die uh, auch die privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Address Schlüsseln, ähm, kopieren und speichern. Y a la hora de distribuir las direcciones de Bitcoin, escribir la fecha, por ejemplo, hoy es el 15 de abril 2015. Escribir la fecha más plus cuatro años uh, igual 15 de abril 2019. And then in the moment when you distribute uh, the Bitcoin addresses, you write the date, for example, today, April 15th, 2015, plus plus four years uh, is April 15th, 2019. Und dann in dem Moment, wenn man die Bitcoin-Adressen verteilt, auf das Papier schreiben, das heutige Datum, zum Beispiel 15. April 2015, plus vier Jahre, ist gleich 15.04.2019. Luego vas a explicar a la gente, mira, esta es la llave privada. Tú y yo la tengo, la tienes. Si no quitas, transfieres este dinero de Bitcoin, eh, en estos cuatro años yo lo vuelvo a tener, tener o sacar. Then you explain to the people, look, this is the private key. I have it and you have it. If you don't take this money, Bitcoin, out of this account, I will take it out in, this, um, in these four years, at the end of these four years. And then erklärst du den Leuten, ciao, das ist der private Schlüssel. Um, ich und du haben diesen privaten Schlüssel, Bitcoin Schlüssel. Wenn du äh, bis Ende dieser vier Jahre das Geld Bitcoin nicht raus tust, transfer, äh, dann hole ich es zurück. De esta forma das más motivación a la gente para empezar a aprender cómo funciona Bitcoin. De 
this way you give more motivation to the people to learn how the technology of Bitcoin functions. Auf diese Weise gibst du mehr Motivation den Leuten zu lernen, wie die Technologie von Bitcoin funktioniert. En mi video antiguo he explicado uh, cómo he tomado la decisión de los cuatro años. In my old video I explained how I made the decision for the four years. In meinem original video habe ich erklärt, wie ich zu die Entscheidung getroffen habe uh, mit den vier Jahren. A continuación voy a pegar este video. Now later I will paste this video. Im Anschluss werde ich diesen Video ankleben. En este momento el precio de Bitcoin es muy económico. Uh, at the moment the price of Bitcoin is very cheap. Pero casi todo el mundo tiene muy poco dinero para invertir. But almost everybody has a very little money to invest. Debería decir que esta idea me vino hoy especialmente cuando vi otra vez una chica ahí pidiendo dinero por la calle. Actually, I must say first this idea today I got especially when I saw again um, one girl begging for money in the streets. Me gustaría ayudar, pero yo tampoco me sobra mucho el dinero. I would really like to help everybody, but I, I don't have either too much money. And así que me vino la siguiente idea. So I got the following idea. It's, uh, it's más bien un juego. Uh, it's a rather a game. Um, lo que es muy importante elegir un monedero de Bitcoin que solo tú mismo misma, tienes la llave privada. What is very important to choose um, Bitcoin wallet a company which you only possess the private key. For example, uh, blockchain.info. Por ejemplo, la empresa blockchain.info. Luego, imprimir en papel um, la llave privada y también guardarlo tú mismo. Then to print in paper the private key and uh, of course save for, for yourself that private key. Bueno, ya estamos imprimiendo, imprime por lo menos 10. So now we are already printing, so at least print 10 directions, 10 direcciones. Luego pones algo de Bitcoin, una cantidad, lo que, lo que te da la gana en esta dirección. Then you put some Bitcoin, uh, the amount, whatever you want in, that, in these directions. Y la próxima vez que sales de casa ya tienes algo que dar a los que están ahí pidiendo por la calle. And the next time you go out of the house, you have already something to give for these people who are begging on the streets. Y por ejemplo, y claro, para tus amigos, amigas, 
and for your friends of course eso da motivación a la gente para aprender bitcoin y this gives motivation for the people to learn about bitcoin y la parte del juego consiste en lo siguiente and the game part uh, consists in the following explicas a la gente mira esta es la cl clave privada que es la clave secreta you explain to the people look this is the private key which must be secret and uh, you have it and uh, me and uh, explicas esa persona y yo mismo la tiene y antes pensaba en cinco años pero luego cambia un poco de idea de hasta cuatro años First, I thought of five years, but then I changed uh, my opinion to four years. Later, explain. Después, lo expli explico por qué. Les dices, mira, tienes cuatro años para poner esta cantidad de Bitcoin a otra dirección. Si no lo, lo has quitado después de cuatro años, yo lo quito. So you explain them, you have four years to take this Bitcoin out of this direction, of this secret uh, key direction. If uh, you don't do it, uh, I do it after these four years. So you lose this. That's the, this part of the game. It's uh, la parte del juego. He creado este hashtag uh, BTC4 para hacerlo un poco popular. I created this hashtag BTC4 to make it a little popular. Antes pensaba en cinco años, pero luego cambié a cuatro porque te has dado cuenta que en los Simpsons la gente tiene cuatro dedos. Y Solo do, Dios tiene cinco dedos. Um, first, I thought of five years, but then I changed my mind to four years. Um, did you notice that in The Simpsons, people have four fingers and only God has five fingers. Uh, I'll show some pictures. Voy a enseñar algunos imágenes de los Simpsons. De los manos y dedos de Simpsons. Some pictures of the hands and fingers of Simpsons. Uh, pero antes quiero recordar que um, es muy probable que en también cuatro o cinco en los próximos años el valor de Bitcoin puede subir mucho. Just want to remember before that uh, the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin can rise very much in these next years. Así que si solo pones una cantidad pequeña más tarde puede ser de gran ayuda. Even if you just put a little small amount later, it can be big help. Uh, no solo para... Bueno, es un juego. <laughs> si la persona lo quita antes de cuatro años, para, es para esta persona. Si no, es para ti. Si te recuerdas y guardas bien la llave privada. So uh, it's, this is the game part, if uh, the, the person takes the money out, it's for that person, but if they forget it after these four years, you can take it out, and it can be really... <laughs> 
Bueno, imprimir también la llave pública y la llave privada. Y si, por ejemplo, ok, first translate. Print not just the private key, but on also the public key. Así que si, por ejemplo, explicas a la gente. Mira, si alguna persona quiere enviarte Bitcoin, pero tú no tienes ninguna dirección, así que puedes dar este, esta llave pública a la persona. Mira, muy bien, la llave pública, no la llave secreta, das a esa persona o cualquier persona y te pueden enviar Bitcoin a esa dirección. So, remember uh, the public key you can give to anybody and if somebody wants to send you some bitcoin and you and this person doesn't have, have any so you have already this public address where they can send you bitcoin